Hey listeners, we're nearing the end of our 15th anniversary fundraising campaign and we need your help to meet our goal. This campaign offers you a chance to win a unique food and music experience in one of the most exciting cities in America. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and you'll be entered to win dinner for two and two tickets to a concert in one of eight amazing cities. New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Ardmore, Pennsylvania, and Asheville. All donations support our work educating food system storytellers. And when you donate, you can choose one of those cities and you'll be entered to win dinner and two tickets to a show. So help us reach our goal and enter to win dinner and a show in the city of your choice. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. The Grape Nation is brought to you by Wine Access. Here's a great way to discover and drink the best wines expertly curated for you. Go to wineaccess.com slash Grape Nation for more info. This week on Meet and 3, we continue our series on global food trade. We've covered sugar and spice. Next up, bites. Iran has been subjected to the far and away the most severe stringent, painful sanctions regime uh, that has been inflicted on a country in peacetime ever. Servers would come around with little carts or trays carrying these things and they would cry out what they were uh, providing. So you get, hog out to my. So my young son, when he was three or four years old, referred to deem some places as screaming places. Tune in to Meet and Three, available wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome to the Grape Nation, your weekly wine journey. Our guest is Tegan Pasolacqua. We'll talk to Tegan about Turley, Sandlands, and a lot more. We'll taste the Sandlands Red Table Wine for our weekly wine sip. I'm your host, Sam Ben Ruby. Stay with us for the Grape Nation on the Heritage Radio Network. We bring wine to the people. Napa Valley native Tegan Pasolacqua cut his teeth in the Rhone, New Zealand, and South Africa before literally planting his roots in California. Tegan started at Zinn Focus Turley Wine Cellars in 2003 and is currently the head winemaker and vineyard manager. He launched his own Sandlands Wines with his wife Olivia in 2011, working with a multitude of varietals, practicing vinehead trading, and dry farming. Tegan Pasolacqua is a true American vigneron and living in the heart of wine country in Napa. Welcome to the Grape Nation, Tegan. Thank you very much, Sam. Uh, nobody knows this, but off air, we had a couple of technical difficulties. We just straightened that out. So we're talking to Tegan remotely via Zencaster, our audio app. Tegan, where are you right now? I'm currently in the hamlet of Victor, California. It's a little uh, farming industrial town three miles east of the town of Lodi. Okay, and Lodi has, you know, been wine country in its own way. Yeah, it's the northern central valley, so it's about 30 minutes south of uh, Sacramento. Okay. Um, All right, so people have an idea where you came from. Give me a quick chronology of your journey in life and wine, you know, that brought you to Turley, which you're currently at, and also running your own winery. Just tell me quickly, you know, how you got there. So I was born and raised in Napa, went away to college, and I moved home. I was in the process of becoming a social worker, and I was offered a job at a winery lab in 2001. And I really kind of fell in love with wine there. I moved to another winery lab, both places where I met a lot of really influential people uh, to my personal life and career. 
And then from there, I headed off to New Zealand. And in New Zealand, I had written a number of letters to some winemakers that I wanted to work for. One of them was Aaron Jordan, and he hired me for a 10-week internship back in 2010. And it's been, uh, or sorry, 2003. And it's been about, it's been 18 years since he offered me that job. And Aaron was the winemaker? He was the general manager winemaker. Yeah, right. Early, uh, and he has his own brand, Fela. And he was also a partner with Bruce Nyers and Nyers Vineyards when right. uh, I was working for him. So he, you know, knows more about the wine business as a whole than anyone I've ever met, you know, from planting vineyards to tasting wine, to selling wine, to, you know, you name right. it. He's the most well-rounded wine professional I've ever met. So two things, getting to where you are, was there any wine in the family? I mean, was there anybody in the business and was there wine at the table or not even that much? And Turley, I mean, you landed at, you know, you didn't necessarily target it or, you, you know, how did you wind up, wind up as an intern at Turley? So for when I, when I worked in the labs, I went to New Zealand and that was my first time working in the cellar. And I realized that I wanted to continue working in the cellar. And one of the, the, the two things that I was really fond of working uh, at Napa Wine Company, I kind of was you know, fascinated with Petit Syrah and reading about how it came from old vines. And then there were a couple Zinfandels that were being made, uh, a wine company, you know, and one of them, you know, Heidi Barrett was making the Lamborn Zinfandel there. And I remember I'd never smelled a wine, you know, it was Howl Mountain Zinfandel. And I mean, just the wine, you know, it smelled like cracked pepper. And I mean, it was, it was pretty mind blowing experience. And then, Joel Gott, actually, he was making his wine brand there, and he was working with a vineyard in Lodi primarily and a vineyard up in Amador County. Uh, you know, and those wines, you know, he was a young guy, and, you know, it was pretty inspirational to see. I think he was in his— Did he expose you to Lodi and Amador? I mean, was he one of the— uh, No, people? but I would, say, I would say those are the first wines that I had. You right. know, he was making a more fry— Zinfandel, and he was making right. a Dillian Zinfandel from Amador. Those were his two single vineyards. And, you know, I kind of, you know, those were my exposure, I would say, originally to, you know, Lodi Zinfandel as something other than just labeled Lodi Zinfandel. Right. Um, I want to get into Turley a little and I want to get into Sandlands. But before we get into that, you know, you alluded to that early interest to old vines and all of that. I want to get into a little of that at the beginning. And I think it frames, you know, where we're going to take the interview. Um, you know, I think you can help me define a few things that I think are crucial to your wine DNA, you know, who you are, what you believe as a wine guy. Um, and I think you've exhibited, you know, it over and over at Turley and your wines and, you know, just the way you think. So what I want you to do is it's a handful of things and I'll remind you, but I want you to get into some brief discussions. And the reason I say brief is I know we can talk about these subjects for a long time. I want you to talk to me about you know, old vines, you know, what attracted you, the importance. I want you to talk to me about what own rooted means other than the fact that it's your Instagram handle. Um, I want you to talk to me about, you know, what head training is and dry farming. And, you know, all of that pretty much points to, you know, doing it organically, which, you know, we could talk about last. But, you know, tell me about the attractions to own, old vines, own rooted ties into that, you know, all of that stuff, you know, tie it together best as you can. Well, I think growing up, uh, you know, my dad had old houses. My dad drove a cement truck his whole life, but worked on old Victorians nights and weekends from when he was 18 years old to, you know, continuing to help me with one out here. And, you know, there was something you know, there's just a different type of people who see potential in things. Maybe I'm a work in progress. And so you can always, you can always see the potential in things. And, you know, it's just like old carpentry, seeing that things were built to last. So when you start working with older vineyards, you start to see all of the 
thought process that went in to make this a truly sustainable planting. You know, they were planted wider spacing because we didn't have, you know, drip irrigation back then. So they were all dry farmed. And, you know, they're just, when you walk an old vine vineyard and you work with them, you really have to just be in awe of them. We have vines where the trunk is split in the middle where you can put your hand through that vine and the vine's still perfectly healthy. You know, there's just a hole in the vine and, you know, it really, you look at most modern viticultural consultants and they would say, oh, you got to rip this whole block out. And when you actually get to work with these vineyards and make wine from them, you see that inherently it's not really a fair competition to people who work with younger vines. The, the wine quality is normally just superior. The colors more stable, the, the acids are higher, uh, you know, the skins are thicker, the, the, the wine itself that you make from it is more stable, it's less resistant to spoilage, yeast and bacteria, and you really see that, you know, it's not, you know, fancy Cabernet plantings, you know, that are tight spaced and irrigated with sets of irrigation. And there's something that, you know, really when you work with them, it's just kind of being in awe and, you know, it, it takes getting used to that there's not a lot that you need to do besides let them do their own thing where modern planting viticulture with vertical shoot positioning and three catch wires and, you know, a lot of steel, that is really for the people that, you know, believe in... <laughs> that they're more powerful than mother nature. And, uh, you know, uh, there's no debating that you can make truly exceptional wines. Uh, I, I always liken modern plantings of viticulture to, you know, an American football player. They have a really impressive 18 year career and then they die. And <laughs> the, the average, a good lifespan, analogy. well, the average lifespan of a, you know, a vineyard in Napa Valley is about 18 years. Wait, and, so just clarify that for me. So a guy, a guy plants, you know, new cuttings, vines, he, he's using the wires and steel and all of that stuff. You know, he's planting them close together. He's irrigating. And you're saying he's got to wait a few years before he can bear, you know, decent fruit. But you're saying, you know, once it gets in its stride about 18 years later, what happens? Do they die? Do they get disease? Do they not bear fruit? I mean, why is the 18 year thing, you know? All of the above, I think okay. normally, be, well, it's, it's because yields start to decline and, you know, the vine has been put, uh, you know, it's a dry, and to get into dry farming, a dry farm vine has to go out and get it for themselves. It has to go search out for water and nutrients. Meaning the, 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 the roots have the to roots go deep the, and struggle for moisture. Well, and struggle, and, it, you know, it, you can say struggle, but it's, it's a, you know, they're, they're on the search for moisture and they're on the search for nutrients. Right. It's not where, a struggle. Well, it's, it's, right. it's the and way it is. With modern, you know, drip irrigated vines, people put the nutrients through the drip emitter. They put the water through the drip emitter. And realistically, the vine doesn't have to, everything's served up on a platter for them. And it can really, they can really perform, you know, like a kind of a stage kid who's, you know, parents their whole life from three years old said, you're going to be a stage kid. That's kind of the same thing, but they don't have this, you know, luxurious career, you know, into their 60s and 70s and 80s. You know, I think an easy way to describe the 18 year, you know, the vines just kind of get burnt out and, you know, uh, they've never had to hold their own weight up. You know, they have these trellis systems that hold the arms of the vine and, you know, support them. And I think, you know, the, the head trained vines, which is another question, it's basically a vine that's planted on a stake. And then you have arms that kind of radiate about a foot and a half from the trunk out and you have usually eight to 12 arms per vine. And that vine has to support itself 
And the, if the arms get too long, the arm breaks off. You know, if the arm gets, if it's too close to the trunk, the fruit rests on the trunk and you can get rod issues. So, you know, you really have to, you know, think of how do you make this vine do it on its own? Right. Um, what, what constitutes an old vine? I mean, I don't think there's a book that says this is what an old vine is, but in your mind, I mean, you look at, you know, a lot of these well, I helped, I helped start a nonprofit called the Historic Vineyard Society, and it's you can check it out, historicvineyardsociety.org. And we are trying to identify, catalog, and educate the public about you know the, the viticultural treasures throughout California. And we called it the Historic Vineyard Society, not the old vine, not the ancient vine. You know, the government has already described historic as things that are over 50 years old. So mm -hmm. that was an easy... So that's sort of your marker, right? Well, that's our marker. And when we formed the Historic Vine Vineyard Society in 2010, it really made sense because at that point, we were going back to 1960. And in California, that's when... You know, people started trellising more vines. They started putting drip irrigation. They started planting in places that, you know, probably shouldn't have had grapevines planted. So when you look, it was, it was as much as a philosophical change on the way to grow grapevines throughout California as when you look at what we consider historic vineyards, you know, 95% of them are, as I described, they're the head-trained, dry-farmed uh you know, vineyard, we, some, you know, and uh, other places they call them a bush vine. Uh, there's a, in, in Sicily, they say arborello, which translates to little tree, little arbor. Uh, right. So you, 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 you could tell the difference, you, you know, what, like difference. any picture that you're in, you're in front of those type of vines, you know, there's none of that metal or wire. Um, well, and we, one of the we things, do farm some vineyards that way. I will. I yeah, will. no, I'm not saying that's the yeah. end all or whatever, right. but that's, well, that's how old vines, you know, grow and exist. You didn't talk about own rooted, which ties into old vines because it's about, you know, the original vine, not grafting. Just talk about that quickly. So basically it is, there's a great pest called phylloxera that started to spread in around the 1850s. And it's an American pest that basically eats, the easiest way is it, it nibbles on the roots and basically it, it suffocates the vines by having, limiting its access to water and nutrients. And it, it actually originated in America it was brought over to France and spread throughout France. And then in about 1870, it started affecting a vineyard in Sonoma County. And what it did was it forced people to figure out how to grow vines primarily in Europe. And th the solution was to graft them onto rootstocks that were native to America, to North America. So they found feral vines that were in uh, the plains that were more tolerant to drought. They found feral vines that were in creek and riverbeds that clearly would need more water. And they discovered that if they grafted the Vitus vinifera, which, you know, we would think is Cabernet Sauvignon, Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, on top of an American rootstock, then the, the, the phylloxera could still be there, but it, it wouldn't the, the roots of American vines were not appetizing to the phylloxera pest. And what happened was, you know, so 99% of, you know, mainland Europe is grafted onto vines that originated, you know, in North America. And luckily in California, we have a couple of regions that have resisted phylloxera and Contra Costa County, which is just kind of uh, east over the hills from uh, Berkeley and Oakland uh, that forms the, the base of the, you know, at the mouth of the Delta. Uh, we have Lodi and we have Amador County. And the, the three things that those regions have in common is sand slash decomposed granite. And 
one of the thoughts of what makes sand, vines plant and sand resistant to fluxor is the silica content uh, is an irritant to the pest. So, so it's more composition of the soil than climate or other things, right? It is. And so, you know, it, you know, sandy soils throughout the world can still grow vines on their own roots. And to me, it's actually the creation of, you know, California with the plates hitting each other and the formation of the Sierra foothills lifting up. You know, if anyone's been out west and gone up to Lake Tahoe or the Sierras, you know that it snows there in the winter, and then as the snow melts, you get snow melt. That that snow melt starts breaking down the granite that the Sierras are formed from, and bringing that granite down, you know, the creeks and then to the rivers and then out through the the delta and out through the Golden Gate Bridge, and that formation right there has spread these little sand squirts through some areas throughout. Northern California, and that allows us to still grow vines on their own roots, which is, you know, one of those things I haven't had the honor to taste the wines, but I know there are people who have tasted, you know, DRC back from the early 40s when DRC was still own rooted. And they say, if you haven't had Latosh from 43, you don't know what it tastes like because every vintage after that was planted on its on American rootstock and the wines just are not the same. Like a Fender guitar after CBS or somebody bought them, it didn't sound the same. Exactly. Um, question. Yes. So is that, if you take Napa and Sonoma and we know, you know, there's just the vines are planted in rows and irrigated and all the wire and metal. Is it because of this, forget the economics for a minute because land is expensive and, you know, making wines expensive is one of the reasons people wouldn't have patience to create old vines up there because of the soil too, or is it just impatience and it, it's impatience and technology, you know, people who made their millions, you know, or even now billions elsewhere, they come to Napa Valley and they want to grow grapes and make a hundred point wine in their lifetime. And instant gratification, right? Instant so that's just the whole. Di that's a whole and, different mindset. I, you know, I get that now. And you know, it. The thing is, it works. I mean, you know, there are people in the Napa Valley. You know, one person specifically who has revolutionized viticulture, I think, throughout the world, and that's David Abreu, who is kind of the word to the stars. Every time we have my boss Larry Turley's wife owns a. Uh, import distribution company called Chambers and Chambers. And they bring in a lot of Burgundy and, you know, some cool Rhone producers. And uh, every time I host, you know, one of their uh, producers, I bring them by David Abrams Vineyards. And these are families who have farmed for multiple generations. Every single one of them says, can you stop the car so I can take a photo? And <laughs> it's the perfect photo. do the work. It immediately know that there's something, you know, there's an extra dimension in his type of viticulture that that no one else, you know, can, the attention to detail, you know, everything just looks perfect. And, and it's not looking perfect just to look perfect. It's, you know, being farmed, you know, extremely well. So, you know, he has, you know, He's changed. He's perfected that, yeah. He's perfected that. And so if someone's coming to Napa Valley and wants to, you know, first of all, you need to buy, you know, great vineyard land, great terroir. And then, you know, you need someone to execute. And, you know, the, there's really, you know, no one better to execute that than, you know, David Abreu. I have, uh, I've been on his wine list for a long time. It, it, you inspired me to crack one open maybe this weekend and just take a gander about that. Let's talk about uh, Larry Turley. Um, you know, Larry and the Turley Wine Cellars is a good story and, you know, how you got involved. You know, in a sense, I see him as sort of a kindred soul and a guy that, saw a vision that you liked you were looking for and you know still continue to believe um you know what what was 
What was Larry seeing and doing then, you know, that other guys weren't? I mean, I guess the old line thing was one of the things, right? Yeah, I think one of the other things Larry was doing was he, everyone says they make wine for themselves, but Larry really wanted to make wine for himself. And, you know, what he was, you know, Larry was an emergency room physician for about a quarter of a century. And I think the average, The average stay is about eight years for an emergency room doctor. And my joke was that, you know, because of that, Larry thinks he can save anything. And he he was attracted to these old vineyards. And, you know, he and John Williams, Larry started Frog's Leap in 81 and with John Williams. And, you know, Larry, Larry turns everything up to 11, whether it's the exhaust on his car, whether it's his hot sauce, whether it's his smokers, whether it's the red paint on all of his vehicles. Like he just, that's the way he lives his life. And, you know, his wines reflect that and have reflected that perfectly. And, you know, through organic farming, it seems, you know, like it would be difficult to kind of revive these old vineyards, but it's really, you know, back to the fundamentals of farming. You know, are you, you know, giving back to the land? Are you being mindful of cultivation? You know, are you being mindful of the inputs? You know, are you, you know, are you being a good steward? Is the land in worse shape after five years or in better shape when you farm it? And it's, it it really is just, you know, the basics of, you know, what is mostly misused now is sustainable agriculture, you know, and I always say sustainable and the first rule of sustainability is that you have to make a nickel and a lot of wineries in Napa Valley do not make a profit. You know, they break even or they lose money. I think that the number is about 70% of wineries do not. But a lot of it is vanity projects, right? Right. But, you know, if you really, that is not sustainable, you know, because no, that's different discussions. So I agree. But if, but if people say we're, you know, people are farming biodynamically and they're farming organically, but they're not making a profit, that is not a sustainable endeavor. Right. You know, right. That is, it encompasses it, everything. Right. Um, so, was Larry, was Larry drawn to Zinfandel? He was. Um, because yeah. there were more old vines and, you know, the practices matched up to his. I mean, it, it, was that a coincidence or as he looked, that's what he realized? Well, they started making, you know, some Zinfandel early on at Frog's Leap. And, you know, Larry, the first wine that really spoke to Larry was kind of the red blend that he was buying at Trentadu, you know, which is likely... It is from the, the, the Witten Ranch, which is the, the base of California's most iconic, you know, red wine of Ridge Geyserville, you know, one of my favorite wines in the world. And, that, you know, Trentadu is the family that owned the Witten Ranch. So most likely when Larry was drinking those Trentadus, he was drinking, you know, kind of the Trentadu family's version of Ridge Geyserville. And he didn't know it at the time. He just knew that he really liked that wine. And I think he'd ride his motorcycle there and buy, you know, a couple bottles. And so well, that, that, that one wine really kind of got him going for sure. And then, you know, yeah. Lee, when he and John decided to kind of part ways with frog's leap, Larry decided what he wanted to do was, you know, single vineyard Zinfandel. And, uh, that was 1993. He made three, Zinfandels, two Petit Syrahs, and one uh, Sauvignon Blanc for Turley Wine Cellars. And uh, I think so, so 20 Tegan, bottled 51 wines. <laughs> I was just going to say, to that point, I mean, you got to help me here because I'm pretty savvy on, you know, Napa and Sonoma wines. Is there anybody else making 47 wines in 50 vineyards that you know of? I, I think so. I mean, clearly Ooh. some larger wine companies i think you know bedrock's definitely very close uh okay you know and I, with we, the care and attention yeah, you know I that mean, you and larry yeah yeah bedrock I, I, is pretty solid you're right 
Yeah, you know, they've, and, you know, we have, I think, a bit broader of a reach, you know, down in Paso Robles, up in Amador County. I mean, Morgan and Chris make some Amador County wines, and uh, they don't make any Paso Robles wines. But, you know, we kind of, you know, it really is an affliction at some point that you really can't, you know, turn down like a good, you know, old vine. We just got a new old vine Zen vineyard in Amador County that basically, you know, in a region that we think that every everyone knows where everything is, you know, we got a new vineyard this week that, you know, I don't know anyone who really knew about it or had ever made a single vineyard wine from. So that's pretty what, um So eyes are always open if the type of vineyards, you know, become available or you stumble on, you know, that sure. the profile, right? Yeah, I mean, are are they out there? Are it still to be found, or it's starting to close in a little? It's closing in, and you know, there, there are a lot of there's a lot of competition. You know, we I explain it to people that Turley has lost the number of vineyards that we have gone in. We either take over the farming, or we, you know, the one thing about Turley is we co-farm a lot of our growers' vineyards. You know, they might not have a cedar to put cover crop or they might not have an ability to spread compost and we you know help with all of that and so what will happen is we'll take over a vineyard we'll compost we'll cover crop we'll prune it back we'll you know convert it to organics and you know five years going and then the owner's like well someone just came and offered me you know 35 percent more than you're paying me and it's like, you yeah, can't control that. Right. Even with the best efforts and helping the yeah. guy, he still can back out. Right. Well, unless you and, lock in a long-term contract. Right. Or, you know, unless yeah, you, that, that sucks, but that's life. Right. And it is. And you know, the, the, the double-edged sword of working with old vineyards is you're working usually with multi-generational farmers, which a lot of them, you know, are sometimes like a lot is still a handshake deal. You know, you have farmers who say, oh, my grandpa said, you know, if you can't just do a handshake. And, it, and so with that, it, it's great, you know, but also you have, you know, no good deed goes unpunished. So you help dial in a vineyard and you vineyard designate it. And then people read about it in a wine review and other people go, well, I want that vineyard. And they say, Turley's only what and you know people kind of forget you know and it happened this year with the vineyard in amador county you know it it you know you, you get new owners and you know people are saying wow you could get so much more money and we were paying 300 percent of what we were the first year we got the grapes we had upped it without them asking 300 percent and somebody and, came along with more yeah and you know when someone but, you know, it's people not having the perspective and this has happened before. And then in two years, they'll call us back and say, hey, you know, just, check <laughs> in. you know, and, you know, Turley's been around for 28 years. You know, Larry's always pays his bills. He's never screwed anyone over. You know, it's right. the of course people would come back to him if, if they got screwed. Well, and the wine industry, you know, one of the greatest blessings of my job is that going out to vineyards and meeting with growers, I mean, I literally have friends who have worked for wineries that, you know, their owners aren't paying people on time and they have to go kind of park in the back of the vineyard to sample because they don't want the, grow the owner to see them and say, where's my money? And so, but that is more common in the wine industry than you would believe even with you know medium to large size wineries and yeah, everybody has a romantic perspective this is like the real land and farming thing um tegan we got to take a quick break yes um and when we come back i want to talk to you about sandlands and a few other things we're talking to tegan pasalacqua tegan is the head winemaker at turley and the proprietor of his own sandlands um before we break and try to answer this quickly um i would never ask you i know you have two boys which one's your favorite dumb question but <laughs> at turley do you have a favorite? Is there a wine that you've enjoyed making more than others or just something that, you know, wows you after all the years you've been there? Well, I would say 
the greatest privilege is probably working with the Hain Vineyard, the Zimfonet yeah. Vineyards Larry started with. It's it's just be ta- behind the town of St. Helena. It was planted in 1902. It's been farmed organically since 1993. It is, you know, and when you mentioned my boys, you know, during COVID, a lot of times the boys would come with me sampling vineyards and we would have, you know, Gotts Burgers at the Hain Vineyard. That was kind of our weekly right. ritual. And I just said to them, you know, they're seven and four, but I said, you know, unfortunately there'll be a day where, you know, I'll tell you, like, I used to get to make wine from a hundred and, you know, 18 year old vines. Isn't that crazy? Because, you know, when the boys are, you know, if they happen to go into the wine industry, like, will there be any hundred and 18 year old vines left in the heart of Napa Valley? And, you know, I just feel, you know, super fortunate to get to work with such a great site. Yeah. Um, I, I, I figured you were going to say, Hain. I've been collecting Turleys since the late 90s, and I pretty much have a vertical of the Hains. I'm not sure what to do with them and when and how. I mean, I have more than one of each, but I'm very anxious to get into them. All right. Um, we're talking to Tegan Pasolacqua. We'll be right back with Tegan. You're listening to The Grape Nation on the Heritage Radio Network. If you haven't checked Wine Access out by now, I think it's time. They make it so easy for everyone to order the most delicious wines from around the world. Whether you're a beginner or a baller, Wine Access's team of experts tastes over 20,000 bottles annually, curating everything from renowned to under-the-radar wine makers. They also have the rare and hard-to-find bottles you've been looking for. Besides buying the best wines, you'll also learn about each wine because Wine Access tells you the story behind the wines, helping you understand and appreciate what makes each bottle special. Check out Wine Access today to find your new favorite bottle. Here's an exclusive offer just for the Grape Nation listeners. 20% off your first order. But to get this offer, visit our special URL, wineaccess.com slash grape nation, and the discount will be applied at checkout. That's wineaccess.com slash grape nation. Hi, I'm Lisa Held, a food and agriculture journalist and the host of The Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network. I know it's difficult to find reliable information on where your food comes from and how that relates to the issues you care about, like the climate crisis, racial justice, and health. With Peeled, my new Substack newsletter, I'm going to make it easier for you. At Peeled, we'll pull back every story's shiny outer layer and go straight to the core. Each week, I'll send you an email with original reporting and expert analysis. I'll make it interesting, I promise. And together, we'll get better at making delicious, healthy choices that align with our values. Subscribe at peeled.substack.com. Okay, we're back. We're back with my guest, Tegan Pasolacqua. Um... We just talked about Turley. Turley is a very important producer, uh, visionary, certainly in Zinfandel, maybe the Mac Daddy. Um, I want to talk to you, Tegan, about your own winery, Sandlands, which you started, I don't know, about 10 years ago, 2010 or so. Tell me how it came about. I mean, why then? you know why then and and you did it with olivia your wife which well, is I nice started thing, it, she's in the- i started it by myself but uh, okay it i started actually making wine in 2009 and uh why i mean the quite you know how did sandlands come about the, the beginning is you started making wine well you know why did you even make you know wine what well was- you know at the time you know aaron jordan was my boss he had his own michael fela he was making it at Turley, you know, it's Larry has his own label, you know, they're very, you know, bad influences on a young guy because you see the life they're living and you go, I want that. And, you know, making wine for other people is fantastic, but making wine for yourself, if you really love making wine is something that everyone, you know, who loves making wine should do even, you know, even if it's not for a commercial standpoint, 
right. you know, you, you have so to. It's, uh, it's for you to some extent. Yeah. It's, it's for you. It really is. Did and they, did they encourage you? I mean, they certainly didn't discourage you. You didn't have to do it, you know, behind the barn, uh, building. Did you, I mean, no, actually but, when I, I was going to do that with my 2009s and, uh, Aaron and Larry, I guess, had a conversation and Aaron came to me and said, Larry and I have talked, we want you to do it here. And I think at that point, you know, I had taken a lot of the responsibility that were, was Aaron's in the winemaking and viticulture side. And he didn't want me thinking about, I need to go do my, you know, punch down or pump over, you know, down in Napa. He wanted my mind there, you know, instead of, you know, wondering what was going on with my barrels and tanks somewhere else. So, Right. You know, Larry lets me make my wine at Turley Wine Cellars, uh, which is, you know, pretty amazing. Uh, and yeah, I just, you know, and then do you have do you have a desire to maybe get your own building or facility or that's not well, I, I actually, right now? I actually have one. So I bought a uh, so I bought a a vineyard in 2012. I bought an old vine Zinfandel vineyard in in Victor, where I am right now, so Eastern Lodi, uh, and the Kirschenman. Let's mention Kirschman. the name. Yeah, so right. it's it's twenty acres, and fifteen acres of the vineyard were planted in nineteen fifteen. And just down the street, I bought a old meat processing kind of one stop shop metal building. It's called East Side Meats. And it's in the town of Victor. And I bought that a little over two years ago, you know, with the purpose of it being one day Sandlands Winery, a small winery. And uh, so when do you think, you know, you may not have a firm timetable, but when do you think, you know, you'll be in there actually making wines? What kind of timeline I, you're looking at? I don't know, you know, because it, it's a complicated question because I right now I get to make my Sandlands wines by my, you know, with my own hands at Turley. And if I'm still working at Turley, I would hate to hire someone to make my wines out in Lodi. I want to, you know, that's not what it's about. Yeah. That's not what it's about. So yeah, I I, get that. I I think that I would like to get it set up in the next couple of years and maybe make like a white wine out here, you know, something that doesn't take, you know, take some baby steps. Yeah, exactly. And take some baby steps and maybe get it set up that after I drain and press my wines at Turley, then I truck the barrels over here and age them, rack them and bottle them here. So it's still, you know, one of those, you know, I'm trying to work through that. You'll know when it feels right. You know, I joked with you off air. I said to you, you make so much damn Zinfandel. I mean, did you open your own winery just to make other varietals? Um, And that's sort of the lead into my question, you know, because one of the nice things about Sandlands is um, you're working with, you know, upwards of a dozen varietals, including Chenin, Blanc, Trousseau, Carignan, Sinzol, you know, and all those other ones. Um, was that, I mean, one of the reasons of doing Sandlands is to, you know, look around at the vineyards and work with those varietals? Yeah, you know, I I think one of the things, I'm just a curious guy. So when I started visiting and kind of managing vineyards, you know, specifically far afield for Turley, I just, you know, if I saw a farmer out disking his vineyard or out, you know, in the vineyard, I would stop by and, you know, have a chance. Right. And so slowly but surely, you know, and I like to tell people this is before Google Earth, so I couldn't go back and like map it. So but surely I just started kind of putting a, a mental Rolodex of vineyards and varieties. And, you know, when I was out helping vineyards uh, that we worked with, those growers that I'd introduced myself to would stop by and say, Hey, are you looking for any fruit? And, you know, a lot of times I would say no, yes. And, you know, working these vineyards, I'm like, I think I found some very special vineyards that no one's really, you know, making, you know, they're going into bigger blends and I'd love to try it out. So in, in 2000, nine, I made some wine that unfortunately I sold in bulk. I never bottled, which is the biggest regret of my profession. What was the grape? 
It was, uh, it was a, it, I mean, it was a blend of uh, Syrah and Morved Mataro from Amador County. And uh, you screwed up. I screwed up. I should have, <laughs> I should have, I should have bottled it. And I would, even if I would have bottled a barrel, I just, I would have loved to have that wine. So, but then I started out in Contra Costa County with uh, Mataro and uh, Carignan. And I, you know, the, the first year in 2010, the first commercial vintage, you know, I made uh, like 175 cases of wine. And then, you know, 2011, I made right about the same. And then 2012, I think I made 300. And, you know, just slowly, you know, I didn't take money for any, from anyone. I just slowly kind of put all the money I had, you know, into buying grapes. You know, luckily I had some good friends who sold me used barrels at a reduced price. Uh, just kind of really, you know, put it together. And, you know, this in 2019, we made uh, seven different wines. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about those in a second. I'm just curious with the wines you make now with the uh, grapes and farmers you deal with, are you just buying the grapes or are you doing a little of what you did at Turley where you have a deal with a guy and you go in and there's you basically. Been of, there's been some of that early on. And I think, you know, there were some growers that I offered. I said, well, I'll pay you to do you know, proper shoot thinning or to drop some fruit. And for the first couple of years, they would do it. And I'd write them a check for like $640 and <laughs> they did the work. And, you know, after about three years, the one grower that was doing a lot of it said, you know what, keep your money. Like it's the right thing to do. And, you know, we're going to do it. So, you know, that was, that was a real great kind of uh, great thing to happen. So you said you made, what'd you say in 19, you made what, eight wines? 17, 17. 17 wines? 17 wines. Jesus Christ. So a, a couple things specifically about the wines. Um, are there some wines you make some years and don't other years? Like are the red and white table wines something you make every year and maybe a varietal you won't make or it's starting to happen each year? It's starting to happen each year. I have, there's a, you know, I lost a number of vineyards due to wildfire and smoke damage in 2020. Uh, and I didn't really, but I've kind of told myself that, you know, as long as I'm making wine, whether it's a half ton or a ton, I want to make a new wine every year. Not that I will add to the portfolio, but I just want to make a wine, you know, to keep you know, the, the juice is flowing. I want to make a new wine every year, whether it's, you know, a, a different vineyard from a variety that I'm already working with. I just, I, I love making wine and I, I just, you know, I, Man, I want I'd love to, I'd love to do a podcast with you in 10 years and see if you <laughs> didn't run the course yet, course. didn't run out of stuff and still right. could do it. I mean, I only hope you the best on that one. Um, what, um, What's interesting to me is, I had Martha Stuman on last week, it seems to me that the varietals that you're working with, you know, you have a deep interest in, but it seems like there's just an increase in interest in California. You know, everybody thinks of California as Napa, Sonoma, Cab, Merlot, Chardonnay, but, you know, a lot of the people I've had on the air, you know, like the Dan Petroskis, the Mathiasons, Martha, you know, Patrick Capiello, everybody's making, you know, wines with these different varietals. I, I mean, is, is this the trend? Are we going to see an expansion of these vines being planted or are people just going to take advantage of the existing old vines? That's a good, that's a good question. I actually think, you know, for it to be, you know, a real, you know, serious movement is people will need to start planting, you know, wines that they, vines that they want to work with. And, you know, I, at my Kirschman Vineyard, I, I planted an acre of uh, Cinso last year because I love the Cinso, you know, the one vineyard in Lodi that still exists. And I 
realize that if people continue want and believe in these varieties and want to still be making wine from them, they also have to add to, you know, it's just not a one way take, take, take. You have to add to the culture of California wine as well. The problem is, is that we know kind of from our discussion that, you know, my belief in old vines and quality. So you have to do it, you know, as much for the future generations, you know, it, it probably even more than for yourself. You know, we get a benefit from people keeping these old vines in the ground. Like we should do the same. So, you know, there are future generations of you wine want your kids running through these kinds of, you know, right. vines. Right. Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I found out doing the show when I talk to people like you and the Jean Gunans and so many other people, it's really all about the farming. If you do that right, you know, you have an opportunity to make good wines because you have good grapes. As far as your cellar practices, I mean, are you doing much things differently at Turley than you are at Sandlands or it's basically, you know, similar principles. I know different varietals, but. So the, the, so I would say similar philosophies, you know, the two differences that I do it, it was Sandlands. I don't use any new Oak and uh, at Turley, we use 20% new Oak and Turley. We use a little bit of American Oak as well, about 20% of, everything is American oak, new and used. And I don't use any American oak at Sandlands. And then for the most part with the reds at Sandlands, I don't destem them where, you know, at Turley, we, all the Zinfandels, we destem them. So that, those are the two biggest differences, but they're all native yeast fermentation. You know, most every wine is unfined and unfiltered. I've never find a wine, you know, at Turley, we make making so many wines every, you know, year or two, there's a wine that we, I decide. Need to find. Yeah. No, we filter more for stability. Like something comes up and it's like, you know what? I don't want, you know, I always say, I don't want Larry pouring the wine at the Skernick tasting. And someone across the table says, what's wrong with this wine? <laughs> you know, well, Larry, when did you get into like natural wines? They're natural anyway, but the way people perceive natural wines now, you know, it's stuff floating around and stuff. Yeah. I mean, but you know, Turley has, you know, when I started at Turley, you know, everything was native yeast, everything was unfined and unfiltered, no matter what, it was just like, this is how Turley makes wine. And, you know, almost blindly and using very, at that point, very low amounts of sulfur for what the rest of the California wine industry was. Right. For sure. I bet. We really haven't changed where other wineries, you know, have become more extreme, but you know, I, I feel like, I, I don't know if people, you know, realize that, you know, the fact that you said it, you know, because that's Larry's sensibilities and yours. I don't know if they realize, you know, that the sulfur was lower than you know, the Turley estate, which, you know, Larry's home estate was the original Frog's Leap Vineyard. And, you know, that's, you know, farmed organically as long, you know, we don't, you know, all of our state vineyards are certified organic through CCOF. And, you know, we don't put any things on the labels. You know, we, we, we do mention it, you know, like on our website and we're proud of it. But, you know, that's not the reason, you know, we do it because we know it makes better wine and it's for the environment and we don't need to kind of you know if people can't tell that the wines are great then it shouldn't matter you know <laughs> uh you know screw them uh, all right tegan we have about 10 minutes left we gotta we gotta move quickly i want to do two things i want you to answer my wine list i'm going to ask you five questions don't dwell on them uh, you know, give me your best answers. This is spontaneous. And then I want to just sip the 19 Sandlands red table with you. And, you know, just, you give me a little, which background. one. So I sent you, I sent you, you both. sent me the 2019 red table wine. I make, but you have to read the label. So there's two. two oh, I'm sorry. Contra Costa. Okay, so I make a Contra Costa County and a Lodi. They're very different ones. You know so what? I sent you, you sent one me two tables. I didn't 
think to look Contra Costa and Lodi. I, I opened the Contra Costa, okay, which I'm no fine worries. with. All right, so now you know. All right, so here we go. Buzz through these questions. What are you, what are you drinking now? What's in your fridge? What are you trying? What are you tasting? What have the seasonal changes, you know, brought? What do you like to drink besides, you know, when you're not tasting and drinking your own stuff? Well, through the last couple months, I've been drinking quite a bit of South African wines, just in solidarity with my friends over there with the with the wine uh, shutdown that have kind of, you know, devastated the South African wine industry. I recommend anyone listening to go buy some South African wine, you know, here in the States. and They make drink. great Shannons and they make great, great Reds. Shannons and the values are hard to, you know, hard to beat in the U.S., so... You know, I'm going to I'm going to stop at that because I think that alone, I mean, people should look for and drink more South African wines and they should support. So let's not confuse it. All right. Tegan's favorite wine and food pairing, something you don't necessarily make or eat every week, every month. But what's that wine and food pairing that just works for you? Every every winter, you know, uh, when Turley's usually bottling, I love, you know, I heart Tartaflet. You know, I love making Tartaflet and, you know, opening, you know, a wide array of, you know, Jura wines and just that kind of comfort food. And, uh, yeah, that's kind of my favorite. So wait, Tartaflet, what is that? Is that like flam? No. What is that? It, it's the, you know, the, the French Alps, uh, potato, cheese, lardon. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it's, nice. You know, and it's so just. So what's a, what's the good wine with that? The, the wines from the Jura, you know. Okay. So, you know, any wine from the Jura specifically. You but. got me on that. All right. Do you have, you, you bounce around a lot. Do you have a favorite wine restaurant and or bar anywhere, you know, in Napa, wine country, in your travels where great selection, great people, good vibe, good knowledge, you know, just the place you go in and it's just comfortable. Anything come to mind to you? Well, I mean, there's a, there's a number of them, uh, you know, the, Definitely uh, a no tree in Napa for, you know, Italian wines. And then, you know, Zuzu, the Tapas Spanish restaurant. And then on uh, for, for, you know, those three have, are welcoming to our family and the wine. Wait, so you are, said a no tree, Zuzu, what was the third? Angel. Angel. Yep. All good ones. Um, I know there were more you visit and more you like, but those are just the th- for you you threw out. I don't want anybody yelling at you. Why didn't you mention me? I I know. (laughs) Yeah, I got your back on that. All right. So fourth question is favorite all-time wine. I used to ask this question like, Tegan, what was the most expensive rarest wine you ever drank? It sort of morphed into Tegan. What's that wine that's just been the most important to you? Had an influence on you or changed your thinking? I mean, what's that wine? Do you, can you think of one or two? Yeah, I would say it's, most likely the, you know, 1988 Alain Grayot Loggy Road. You know, that wine was given to me by Jack Chambers, who, you know, founded Chambers and Chambers, and they brought in Grayot before I went to, you know, I was leaving Turley trying to quit back in 2005 to go work for Alain Grayot. And Jack Chambers said, hey, I want to give you a bottle. And he gave me an 88 Loggy Road, and it was just, you know, it was just perfectly aged and it, you know, I was emptying on what I thought was a new journey. And yeah, that wine just, I, I can still smell and taste it right now. He's still making great wines, man. His, you know, his wines are great. All right. That's a great answer. And that's, that's the way to answer that question. Last question. And you should be able to help me with this. I mean, I have a lot of Psalms on the show, restaurant people. I have a lot of importers, um, Talk to me about the best wine around 15 bucks, 15, 20 bucks. Give me a red and a white. You can give me a category. I always say Muscadet is a good value or whatever. And I always say my kids are in their mid, late 20s and they can't buy crappy wine, but they can't afford 50 a bottle, you know. So, so what are good wine values, you know, around that? The best name I've ever heard for Muscadet Back in the early days of the Terroir Wine Bar in San Francisco, someone said, "Oh, that's broke Psalm juice," you know. And I just, <laughs> you know, it's like, 
You know, that's what all the broke Psalms were sitting there drinking. But that's a good thing. I mean, if yeah. Psalms are drinking it, they know what they're drinking. So well, you agree would, Muscadet's a good white value? No, I, well, yes, but I want to give a different answer. I really think, you know, back to South Africa, Audi Badenhorst, Secateur, Chenin Blanc for like. Wait, Audi, spell for me because I post everything. So Audi Badenhorst, B A D E N H O R S T. So he's in the swear. He makes. His secateurs, which is the name basically for pruning shears, he makes a Chenin Blanc that's around fourteen dollars. You know, you can get it sometimes for like twelve. That's it's, the home run right there for the white, right? It's it's from old vines in South Africa that are dry farm. I mean, it's it's you shake your head and just say, you know, why why do we try to compete with this? I know I'm amazed at the price and the quality. All right, give me a red in that vein. So under $20, I mean, unfortunately, you know, I'm trying to think of, you know, most of the, the one wine that I think it may have gone up just in the last year or two, but would be the, the Terranere, you know, the Etna Rouge, just the, that wine, you know, I used to be able to get for nineteen ninety nine, and that well, you're close. I mean, I'm not boxing you in, but I think that's the, I think that that region is great, and that it's close to that price point, and that that wine always delivers, always delivers, and you know, it's that, that's a that's a good reco. All right, so like I said, I you know I promote the show and post, so we're gonna post your answers um, before we wrap up. We have a few minutes. You know, every week we taste a different wine on air for a week, weekly wine sip this week. Um, Tegan sent me a couple of bottles. We're going to taste the 2019 Sandlands Con Contra Costa County Red Table Wine. So right away, Red Table Wine means a blend. So tell me about the vintage, the wine, you know, what's in it, and then we'll taste it. So this is the vineyard from the first wine that I started Sandlands with, and the first year I made the, I always made the Carignana Mataro separately, but in 2010, I really wanted to blend the two together. And it took me from 2010 to 17 to do it. So it's, it's a single vineyard planted in 1922. It's on its own roots. It's dry farmed. And the blend, I, the, the two varieties are harvested a little over a week apart, but it's 65% Carignan and 35% Mataro, which other people in France would know as Morvedre. Okay. Um, and the 19, it was just an article in one of the, I think, Punch or whatever about vintage, or even I think Eric Asimov from the Times talked about vintages. Um, but the 2019 vintage for these grapes, stellar ball, tough. Okay. Yeah, I mean, all so of that reflects in the wine. I think so. I mean, it, you know, we've had a string of, you know, 18 and 19, you know, and 16, just a string of such strong vintages, you know. Yeah, I'm happy for you for that. Um, so I opened the wine and I let it sit in the glass and it was a little lighter. And as it sat in the glass, it got a little darker. It's got a nice you know, kind of dark red color with a little lighter rim. Um, I love that. I love the way that, you know, it kind of grew in the glass. I think this wine doesn't hurt letting it sit in the glass or the bottle open. Um, tell me this wine. I mean, what do we get on the nose? Well, I think you mentioned it. You know, it's kind of in a mix between red and black. You know, the color is, you know, it's got some ranges to it. But when, you know, it's kind of almost violet in color when you swirl it. Uh, Yep. There's a brightness to it, but there's also those darker fruits. Well, and I think, so the brightness is coming from the Carignan, right? So, I mean, think of Carignan, you get this brightness, and then you get the darker fruits from the Mataro, you know, and this wine has, you know, unbelievable natural acidity. I think the finished pH, those who care, is like 3.31 you know, I picked that up right away, which led me to believe that this would be, you know, great with different kinds of foods, which we'll talk about. The mouthfeel to me is medium, medium plus. It's got a good full, you know, it's not a thin wine, but it's not this unctuous wine, but it coats your mouth. Um, that comes from the dry farm vines, you know, that you can make. Yeah, that's see, that's where that's where the, the difference is. Right. Um, no tricks, no sun on the palate. Is the palette similar to the nose descriptors or do you pick up, you know, new things on the palette? 
I think you pick up, you know, some new things, you know, it's the, the palette's fresh and structured at the same time. Uh, you know, it's not extremely tannic. I think the acid follows through, uh, you know, over time, I always get in this wine, you know, in Contra Costa in general, you, you can, even though the color doesn't lead you to this, you can get stone fruits like, you know, peach and nectarine. And yeah, I see that. You know, I'm not great at picking up all those subtleties, but when I think about it, you know, they're either there or they're not. And beyond the power of suggestion, it's like, oh, yeah, that's what that was. What are the per? It's all like, I mean, that's a characteristic, too, that you get in red wines from sandy soils is you get these kind of stone fruit aromatics that you don't get in a lot of, you know, I don't really ever pick it up in clay soils or. You know, that's a cool thing to know. People should make note of that. I certainly will. What's a, what are the classic pairings with this? I mean, I kind of think, you know, it's, you know, bistro food, you know, I think goes really. Like a steak uh, with frites, a burger, yes. roasted chicken. Roasted chicken, exactly. Uh, you know, Fries. But it, it, it can also, you know, clearly because of, you know, the varieties and their origin, I think it does really well with you know you know spanish inspired you know northern spain inspired food as well so i I love it i I thought it was going to be i'm like oh no here's another grapey taste table wine i think it's it's got nice complexity i think it's delicious like i said sitting in the glass it only got better you know it's a young wine and it's not showing i haven't released it yet by the way kudos to you i you know i think it came out great i mean visually it's stunning this will be released in the fall. So, uh, all right. So that's the 2019 Sandlands Red Table wine. It'll be out in the fall. It's this we're drinking the Contra Costa County. Tegan, I told you the hour was going to go by fast. Yes. We got to wrap up. I'm going to do a quick wrap up, and then I want to ask you for a couple things, and then we're out of here. So, if you have a, a question, suggestion, wine happening, or event, hit me up at sam at thegrapenation dot com. That's sam at thegrapenation dot com. Subscribe to the Grape Nation podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you get your pods. But subscribe because you'll get the show thrown up at you every week. Um, Follow us at Facebook at the Grape Nation on Instagram, a little trickier. We're at S Ben Ruby on Instagram and at Ben Ruby on Twitter. But you can always use the hashtag the Grape Nation on both. As I mentioned earlier, we'll post Tegan's wine list. I'll give you all those answers and I'll give you a little more information on the weekly wine sip selection that we just tasted. Um, Tegan, if we want to get more info, track your wines down and all that, where are the best places to go? The web sites the website and then if you're in uh so give me sandlands first so it's, it's sandlandsvineyards.com there you go sandlands and people interested in turley if you haven't heard of turley by now okay but early wine sellers yeah it's never too late so go to turleywinesellers.com and if you want to follow tegan um, you can go to at own rooted, right? O W N R O O T E D. Yes. All right, Tegan, that's it. I want to thank you for doing this. I want to thank, thank you, you for, for the wine. Me. I want to thank you for everything you're doing. You're doing some great stuff. I know people, um, always look towards you, um, to see what you're doing and how you're doing it and asking you what to do, which is a great thing. Cause you're doing it right. I want to thank our engineer, Matt at heritage radio, I'm Sam Ben Ruby, and you've been listening to The Grape Nation. The Grape Nation is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Instagram and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. You can also find us at facebook.com slash heritage radio network. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. 
Want to be part of the food world's most innovative community? Subscribe to the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join the HRN family by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. And thanks for listening.